So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I am joined by my wonderful co-hosts, uh, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry, who's roaming in a Nigerian supermarket as we speak. So you may not hear from him uh, till later. Um, but today we are joined by our extra special guest, uh, a man who has inspired and helped create the very medium you're listening to us on today. Uh, the company creating, idea generating, Bitcoin loving and shitcoin hating, the podfather, Adam Curry. How are you doing today, Adam? Good, thank you. Now, are you sure this is just a regular podcast or is this some kind of game show where I make the guy run through a supermarket in Nigeria and grab the, the following items? Is that what this is? Or are we going to talk about something else? I would like to turn it into the game show that you just described <laughs> because uh, man, I did not have that could idea. could be streaming and... sats, you know, like run faster, Jerry. You can do it, man. Go get the milk. And no, no, no. It has to be 2% milk. <laughs> we, need to, we need to do that. We'll, what we'll do is we'll, we'll, have, we'll, we'll set this up for you and we'll have uh, all three of us. It will be in different supermarkets. I'll be in Brazil. I love, Brazil, it. Jerry I, love and it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Yes. Compete. Is that where you all are? You're in Brazil? I'm in Brazil currently, and then mm -hmm. uh, Colombia and Nigeria. So yeah, we're all, and the UK usually, as you can tell from the uh, the giveaway accent. Gotcha. Um, well, you're connected yeah. to Texas uh, here, so we we've got a, a a good mix. This is an awesome international showdown. I like it. Um, well, yeah. I, first off, I wanted to start off just with a question for you. Actually, it gets gets kicking on the uh, the crypto train since it's what we're technically about with this podcast. Um, Bitcoin for you. How did that come about? Like when did, because you're quite an early adopter kind of guy, hence the, you know, the web, the web in the very early nineties and uh, podcasting in general, podcasting 2.0, it seems like you're at the front of essentially everything. So when it comes to Bitcoin, how did you come across that? What went through your mind? How did that change things for you? Uh, well, I came across Bitcoin multiple times and I've learned very hard lessons and uh, have uh, bettered my ways. So having, you know, being uh, doing the No Agenda podcast for, uh, we're in our 15th year now, uh, we predate Bitcoin, but when Bitcoin was just starting, we got a lot of people emailing us saying, Bitcoin, 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 here, set up a wallet, I'll send you some Bitcoin. Uh, it's going to be the thing. And, uh, you know, we run our entire podcast, have done for 15 years as value for value, meaning we only ask people to give us the amount of money they found the show worth to them. And that has been very successful for us. Uh, the problem that we had with Bitcoin is, well, don't send me Bitcoin. It's not a donation. I can't really do anything with it. I can't pay my rent with it. And that's how we view that for many, many, many years. Uh, so, so long, in fact, that by 2015, I took an interest in, uh, in trading securities, uh, day trading on NASDAQ. Um, I, I kind of really got into it, had a little group. And to fund that, I sold my 65 Bitcoin I had been given for free uh, for $1,000 each. So you can imagine how much I regret this decision. Um, so when uh, a couple things happened at the same time, um, now I'd already uh, seen the error of my ways of Bitcoin uh, pre-pandemic and was very pissed at myself and always was kind of keeping an eye out on it. Um, I simultaneously discovered the Lightning Network um, when the when the pandemic was kind of hitting, um, with the with the price dipping to you know f below four thousand dollars. And my wife and I, when that happened, we looked at each other and I said, "Look, <laughs> this, let's not be stupid. L let's just do this." So we we piled in uh, at the four thousand level and have been buying all the way up, uh, and have not sold anything uh, on these uh, on these dips. Um, and that kind of went right in line with, uh, with podcasting 2.0 and, uh, the, our value for value streaming payments through the lightning network, um, which is just fantastic because it's a great way to stack sats, you know, and it's, even if it's, if it's 10 a minute from somebody, 10 sats, it's sats. And, uh, you know, so the whole living, living within Bitcoin really became a reality because I'm also taking sats that I receive from people listening to my podcast, and I send them to other podcasts. So we are distributing value in a, in a system um, that has a defined, net, well, not a defined network topology, but um, we know how to connect all the different nodes and wallets. Um, and that's a real ecosystem. We're probably pumping one to two million uh, sats through the system from listeners to podcast on any daily basis. You know, and this is just with 
think we have maybe 8,000 shows or something that are, that are using it. So this is, this is really starting to happen. And for me, it's just Bitcoin is the future if we're going to be able to get out of our current situation. I just wanted to ask, could you explain to our listeners what the podcast index is and um, kind of what inspired you to create the podcasting 2.0 movement? I'd love to. Um, so I invented podcasting with Dave Weiner uh, initially, well, actually in 2000, but it wasn't until I saw the iPod that I put it all together and said, oh shit, well, here's a script. Now let's go build better radios, which are basically podcast apps. Um, the uh, when uh, Steve Jobs called and said, "Hey, can I put podcasting into iTunes?" I'm like, "Yeah, I would, hell yeah!" You know, like, what kind of question is that? Uh, but I also gave him kind of the index. You know, we had built up an index of, of podcasts around the world. It was an open source index, and I was off creating shows and building networks and making podcasts and didn't really think about since I'm a radio guy that we needed radio receivers. We need you know uh, we need lots of choice in uh, podcast apps. And what kind of happened by default is because Apple was the first out of the gate and it worked on the iPod, they became, in, in a way, even though you set up your, your podcast feed with a hosting company, you had to submit it to Apple to be in their app. And they became kind of the default on-ramp to podcasting. And uh, more egregious, really, is the way the Apple podcast app worked, they had an open API, so any developer could create a podcast app against the Apple uh, a database, the Apple Index. And that worked very well for well over a decade um, until um, Apple decided to deplatform some podcasts. And this was a very coordinated effort. Uh, they did, Facebook did it, Twitter did it, YouTube did it. And they all took down a number of podcasts, uh, most notably the Alex Jones uh, show InfoWars, but also a couple of other kind of innoc innocuous podcast you know, x22 report which is who cares if it's conspiracy theory you know it's like and when apple did that it disappeared from all apps well no 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 i thought that this is not going to stand and all that needs to do all we all needs to be done is we just need to create a new index which is not hard to do uh we now have the largest well over four and a half million podcast feeds because we don't deplatform anything it we're just like google it's just links in there. Now, the difference is we make an API available, which is very rich and well-documented. So any developer can create a podcast app and a different experience without all the heavy lifting or without the fear of being, you know, uh, screwed over by Apple changing things. Um, so we did that and we started that. And then we also saw that there was a huge pent up demand because of this this balance between Apple not really doing anything, so no features added. You know, you can add a feature to podcast host, but if there's no app that will actually understand what to do with that, such as chapters or transcripts or, or even payment information, then there's no reason developing it. So now we had a new index. Apple capitulated fairly quickly. They fired their original team. They started to do uh, subscriptions. They've kind of given up on on really supporting the, the open podcast uh, ecosystem. So we became the default. So this is very good news. And we have podcast hosts now adding features that we've also added to it. Um, and there's now at least 15 new apps. There's about 10 hosting companies that have some, at least some of the new features. And most importantly, we see that the way to stifle free speech, which is really all I care about. I don't care... You know, there's legalities to what you can say. There's tort law. That's all fine. People should be able to sued, be sued for what they say, but they shouldn't be taken down from, you know, just speaking. Uh, and a great way to do that is by, uh, you know, cancel culture uses advertising as the mechanism. Uh, people, a lot of people have moved to um, donation-based models, either value for value like we do, utilizing Patreon, PayPal, other systems. Now we see that PayPal is deplatforming people. Oh, we don't like the content you make. You can't accept donations through us. Um, uh, you see this happen all the time, even with big crowdfunding like the the truckers in uh, in Canada. You know, they crowdfunded seven million dollars. Boom, they freeze the account. Well, we have to make sure it's legit. You know, all this bull crap. Um, so, uh, and it gets worse where it's not even PayPal, but it's down the line the actual processor, which is Mastercard. They're one of the wokest companies in the world now part of the World Economic Forum, 
uh, you know, big partnership there. And so like, you know, we just won't process payments for you. And that's for, you know, it's for all kinds of businesses, including, you know, so what if people want to send uh, own money to an OnlyFans star? So what if people want to sell CBD or, or even marijuana legally in a state? So what if people want to do that? No, you can't because you're locked out from the digital money system. So with podcasting, um, I was looking for a way to really do this value for value in real time. So I value this podcast at, I don't know, a dollar an hour of listening. So every minute, I want one sixtieth of a dollar to be sent to the podcaster, directly from my wallet to your wallet. And when I found Lightning, and um, I set up a Raspberry Pi, you know, and got fully noted, and like, holy crap, this thing is really scriptable money. And you can broadcast it through something called Keysend. So you don't need to have an invoice. You just need a, a node that is on uh, online 24 seven and you can literally broadcast money to that person, which as a broadcaster is like, fuck, I understand this. So we made it so that when you're listening, you're literally getting value in ones and zeros translated to MP3 into your ear as sound that you enjoy and process in your brain. At the same time, you're sending back micropayments. We finally made it work. Micropayments of the value so the minute you stop, hey, this is a one-hour show. I stopped at 30 minutes. I've only sent 50 cents. In addition to that, we added the boost button. So you can set up kind of like a, a super chat on, uh, on YouTube. You can say, hey, bam, I just want to send 1,000 sats or 100,000 sats. And I want to add a message, which we call a boostagram. This is turning out to be incredibly popular. People are sending $25, $50, $100, $500, $500 all through the Lightning Network. They're loading up, you know, every app now has its own wallet. So this, this direct payment system is, has taken off like no one expected in a very short amount of time. We added one thing to it, which I think is critical moving forward for all digital media. And remember, this really only value for value, I think, really works with media products because, you know, what is it? A podcast to one person is a lifeline. It got them through the pandemic. To another person, it's a piece of crap and four jerk offs talking on screen, not interested. So that value can only be determined by the person consuming it. Um, uh, that, for that very reason, everything needs to go. We, there can be no middleman, just like Bitcoin itself. So the only thing the podcast index does is maintains a directory of where you want your payments to go. So that when an app says, okay, I'm going to play this and I need to send payments, where does it go? They can get that from the RSS feed, which is always the source of truth, which you control as the podcaster. For ease, we've made all of that available and stored in the index. It's a lot faster, quicker, et cetera, for, um, for, podcaster, for um, podcast apps to get it from us than to parse every RSS feed. But they can always go to the source of truth. And, and, the, person, and the only person who can change it is the owner of the feed. Um, so we added something called the split. Whereas on this show, um, you know, I would like to send you a dollar or $5 an hour. You would have three lightning addresses, possibly four. You would have, um, maybe you would split it up like 25% uh, Ricardo, 25% Lawrence, 25%. Now we got to give Jerry 30 because he's running around a fucking supermarket. And then maybe you give, you know, your top promoter, um, you know, 5%. Maybe you give your guest a little bit and add his or her lightning node to it. The apps now in real time will have this information and will send four different payments or five or six or whatever it takes. And this is a digital, a decentralized digital royalty system that rivals none. No one can beat this. There's no ASCAP BMI. There's no Harry Fox agency. There's no, you know, no, um, what are the sound scan when it comes to music? None of this. It's directly between the listener who gets value and wants to send value back, and it goes directly from wallet to wallet. There's no middleman. This same model can be applied to music and can be applied to uh, anything you can basically attach in an RSS feed would work. Right now, podcasting is the test bed, and it works so well that you know, one of our new features is chapters, which takes time. You know, So I don't have time to go through my three-hour show. Uh, we have a guy named Dreb Scott. And he listens to it and he uses yet another podcasting 2.0 app, Hypercatcher, where you can mark things 
And then you go back and then you, those become chapters and you can add text, you can add an image and you can add a link. Um, I give him 5% of all of my value for value payments and he's building a business. He does it now for four of my shows. He does it for three other shows that people, and so now he has sats coming in from everywhere. So, oh, and one other thing, um, uh, the app itself that you're using, they will also take a piece and that will be on top of your value split. So Bree, the Breeze app, for instance, they take 5%, whereas um, Podfriend, I think, takes 2%. And it's all based upon their users, right? They use, you like this app, you know, Breeze does a lot more than just podcasting. They say, we need 5%. Everyone's fine with that. Everyone's cool. And everybody makes money. Bitcoin incentivizes the entire ecosystem. And now we're even seeing podcast hosting companies who are saying, wait a minute, so what if we offered the wallet services to our podcasters and we, because they, they do a lot of education and handholding, um, we could take an extra percentage or we could even start to give people cheaper hosting because we're getting a piece of the streaming payments. So this changes the entire game. And it's really, if you look at the, the two promises from the late, late 80s, early 90s about the internet, here's what everyone said. Uh, in the future, uh, your refrigerator will automatically order your, your milk when it senses that your milk supply is low. Well, I still have to see that fucking refrigerator. The other promise was micropayments. And, and now we have it. Micropayments for media. It is here. It is working. And people are making money with it. The only requirement it has outside of technical aspects is you need to ask people to support the show. If you just think that people will load up wallets and start streaming and understand how to do it and care, you're wrong. My wife uh, is a semi-retired now, but um, career-long uh, nonprofit communications uh, C-level suite, chief communications officer. And she says the number one reason people don't give to nonprofits for good causes is because they weren't asked. So you have to ask. You have to ask, hey, is this show worth anything to you? What is it worth to you? You can go to the movies and sit in a dark theater for an hour and a half with a date, maybe have a hot dog, popcorn, and a, and a Coke, 50 bucks. That's your night out. That enjoyment, you know, did you get the same type of enjoyment from listening to three hours of this podcast? Was it worth 50 bucks? No. Was it worth 20? You tell me. Maybe, you, maybe five bucks is a lot of money to you. And what you find is that if you ask that, a lot of people will give you $5. A surprising amount will give you 50 and yeah, there'll be $500. And over time, and I've done this long enough, it balances out very, very well and is so much more enjoyable than any other way of monetizing, certainly advertising, because you have no meetings, you don't have to self-censor, you can talk about any product you want. You are, you are a free person, uh, free to speak your mind. And if you don't satisfy the audience, if they get no value, then your show will, will not make any money. And the, the inverse is true. And that's what I've learned. And that's what I'm applying. And at this point in my life, my entire mission is to make this system work well for guys like you. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm 57. I'm looking at, you know, 30 year olds and they need some good shit. And so we're putting our, and it needs to be like good shit, meaning it can't be canceled. You need to be able to speak and you need to be able to hear and you need to be able to support. And so this is my part of the system where other men my age are building food networks with like the Texas Beef Initiative. Others are building new schooling systems. Others are building new um, healthcare networks of independent doctors and, you know, with off the shelf technology. Um, we have to build all these systems in parallel. And the one thing that can bind us and has proven to bind us together is Bitcoin. That's, uh, you raised a lot of pretty salient points. So I think like, uh, what's astonishing to me is when I came across Lightning in I think 2019, it was just beta kind of style thing that a lot of people didn't believe in. And I could never- You may lose all it. your funds if you've tried yeah. this shit out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 lost, I, remember. I lost money in the early days. For sure. We all lost fucking money on it. Of course we did. <laughs> it's amazing, right? But like to see where it's come in, what, three years or so? I never could have imagined, like when I just saw it, okay, well, you use this to send payments. I never could have even imagined that it would support and essentially an entire like podcasting effort. Uh, it's kind of astonishing to me. Um, like when it comes to, 
because obviously you mentioned about like Alex Jones, people being deplatformed. Uh, obviously, like people have realized recently, Joe Rogan, there's been this threat of him being deplatformed, but Spotify seems to be holding uh, their ground for now. Um, do you have you ever like? Do, are you reaching out to people who get deplatformed to kind of just like describe and talk talk people through this and offer to help them kind of? Because obviously, you know, if, if I'm just me three years ago and I hear I've got to get a node and do this and that, I, I'm going to be terrified and have no idea what I'm doing, right? So I'm assuming someone like Alex Jones is probably going to think the same thing. So do you like reach out to people to like offer to help them or or, or like talk to any of them at all? Or, or what, what do you do there? Yeah, um, yes. Uh, Twitter is typically the place where people say, hey, you know you should talk to Adam Curry about this. And, and I will always send them to value for value.io value number four value.io. Uh, we also have podcasterwallet.com. So if you go there and you uh, enter your feed details and it'll immediately give you, I think four options uh, for wallets to receive and you can, and any podcast, any podcast can be set up value for value within 15 minutes. It, it really, it, that, that part we've solved. So we usually just say, hey, it's over here. Run through it. If you got a problem, let us know. We'll help you. Shit breaks all the time. Um, so I have, of course, reached out to, to many people. Uh, uh, the Alex Jones people have been implementing their stuff for months and months and months. I, I'm sure eventually they'll, uh, they'll get it done. The Rogan thing, I will say, is a little bit different. Uh, and Joe's a friend. And, and to be honest, when it kind of happened at the same time, the deplatforming through Apple and Rogan leaving for Spotify, because we also, something else happened. The number one draw that um, all of these apps had was showing Joe Rogan's face, you know, like, hey, you can listen to Joe Rogan here. That disappeared too. So we need to have a, a better system, A, that's more attractive because the next Joe Rogan may not have the $100, $100 million Spotify deal. We need to help the next Joe Rogan and the apps that that people use to listen to him. And that's why we need a real functioning system where you can't be taken down and we have we can have that receive money. The problem Joe has right now is a little different than it was a year ago. A year ago, it was the woke people complaining about him platforming people with uh, ideas uh, uh, contrary to their ideology. This is different. When the minute, and, and by the way, look at the mainstream media. So when there was controversy before about Joe Rogan, once in a while you'd see, a, oh, well, you know, podcaster Joe Rogan, you know, hates trans women, whatever. That would be the headline. Now they're doing full-blown pieces. They're showing full-blown clips because it's about COVID. And it's not just about COVID. It's about something very specific, what works and what doesn't work. Now you're stepping on some huge fucking dicks because the mainstream media is owned, bought, owned, paid for by the pharmaceutical industry. Just look at all the sponsored by Pfizer shit. So they know, hey, wait a minute, mainstream media guys, hello, this is Pfizer talking. Um, you have about a million people each. Joe Rogan has 10 million. He's telling people not to take our product. You better get on that fucking stick, children. And that's what's going on here. And, and as long as Joe keeps talking about uh, things contrary to the pharmaceutical messaging, he will have trouble. Once he stops that, his, tr his trouble will be over. So it does kind of show the problems with the advertising model. Um, and this is it. That's his enemy here. It's not, woke people have no control over Spotify. Does the pharmaceutical industry have control? Yeah, at, cer at a some certain point, I think they may. We'll see how that goes. But that's his enemy and that's all of our enemy, really. <laughs> you know, this, you can't have a, a media outlets that are controlled by an industry. That's just not healthy. Whether, whether the, the, what they make is good or bad doesn't matter. You, that's just not a healthy, a healthy place to be in. And that's very unique to the United States. And I believe Australia, I think, is the other country that, uh, that allows pharmaceutical advertising on television. Um, so it's, uh, it's very destructive. And... Uh, and that's where he's going to continuously run into problems. We'll see how that goes. I saw a, um, I, I don't know how legit it is, but um, on the Fediverse, I saw somebody was saying that Neil Young's like song catalog is actually owned by uh, BlackRock, who owns Pfizer also. So uh, that's where like the Neil Young pressure came from. Yes. Um, 
That's possible. I mean, uh, we probably should look and see how much uh, stock BlackRock owns in Spotify and, and if they're increasing that because they are very much now not just passive hedge fund but they are passive investment firm. They are an activist firm and mainly around environmental social governance, the ESG score, which uh, does uh, create woker companies and does defund uh, anything except... Uh, green agenda uh, energy companies and it does a lot more you know it, it may favor um certain uh, political ideologies etc so it seems like there's a lot of control there um neil young doesn't doesn't control his fucking music on spotify neil young did not take his music off spotify spotify went oh neil you got a problem boom done you're gone that's what happened there and that's their right and they'll do it to everyone who comes along and they'll keep doing that, and that will end. the the artists The artists are angry at the at the music business. They're angry at Spotify. They're angry at the statutory payments, which are shit for streaming songs. They're angry about that, and they've been angry for a very long time. So this is a way for them to get back at Spotify. In fact, if Neil Young and uh, Joe Rogan sat down, they might agree on a hell of a lot more than we think. This is just Neil Young being pissed off because he feels ripped off or whatever. And it's the same for Joni Mitchell and God knows what else. This is, uh, that's a whole different game. I don't think they are angry at Joe Rogan at all. And you even see the mainstream hosts were like, well, you know, we don't really want Joe Rogan taken off Spotify. You know why? Because they all have podcasts on Spotify and they all want the next $100 million deal. So it's a big, it's a big uh, charade, except for the part that the pharma companies want Joe Rogan to stop talking alternatives. I'm glad it's Joe doing it because I feel like he's at least one of the very few who are big enough in name and listener base to kind of get away with it, at least for the time being, right? I feel like a lot of other people would have been shut down pretty damn quick. Um, so I'm glad at least it's him standing up a little bit and actually doing this. I've just checked it out. BlackRock has 1.37% of Spotify. Um, but there's a ba Bailey and Gifford and Co that has 116 and that's another investment it's a uk based investment firm basically it's mm, just a ton of different like management and investments arc investment owns two percent morgan stanley owns six percent collectively so it's it's basically a load of different investment firms that all as far as i'm aware have some kind of ties to whoever their investors sure. are for them well i mean black blackrock is 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 a great boogeyman and i like it because the fink as i call him larry fink runs that and this guy's a total jack off. He is screwing up. He's it's an attack on the free market, you know, getting this bullshit SASB rated ESG score, which is, you know, you and I could come up with a, a scale. Say, oh, well, this company, you're just not woke enough. You know, so that's what he's driving. And he owns 10 or has $10 trillion of assets under management. Those guys are moving markets for sure. I mean, I guess one of the things that I, because at Spotify as well, they, they because you, as you said, Apple originally, and Apple loves wall gardens, as everyone knows, and Apple originally kind of took on podcasting, didn't actually monetize it really, but like kind of made it, at least they kind of owned it for a, a fairly long time. Uh, and then it feels like Spotify is trying to buy podcasting, I suppose, with Joe Rogan, and, and they keep shoving it in my Spotify app a lot more. Um, and I kind of always used to use a separate app for podcasting. I still do. Um, so I feel like if, if, you'd, if you could go back to when you were asked to have that meeting with, with Steve Jobs, or even when you sort of helped and, and essentially set up and created uh, podcasting as it is, uh, podcasting 1.0, uh, would you, knowing what you know now, sort of want to do anything differently would you like maybe you know act differently in any way i know obviously at the time there was no lightning network so that's not exactly very easy but is there anything you would have done differently i suppose because obviously you're creating an open protocol an open thing so it's it's open source right and so i don't know if there's anything you could have done but i suppose you know learning the lessons you know now about the different companies always trying to take ownership of podcasting uh is there anything you would have done differently kind of like with tim berners lee and the internet like you know i wonder if he has any regrets um well um if uh if the queen had balls she'd be king let's say that first of all um yes i would have uh completely not wasted my time raising money trying to start a podcast network because uh, with this assumption i would have known that that doesn't work and uh, and i can prove it and i can show that none of them work it's just not the nature of podcasting um, I would have focused entirely on the index. I, I would have made sure that there was an open index. What I'm doing now, I would have done then. And really the mistake I made is I um, 
as a radio broadcaster from origin, I, oh, I took for granted that there were always radios. There's always a radio in your car, in your house. There's always a radio somewhere. And all of a sudden we had a great broadcast system with, you know, no transmitters just uh, through the internet. And we didn't really, you know, I let some corporation capture the radio market. And that was, and that was Apple. And then Apple really did something not cool, although understandable, is they said, well, you can't really play on our radio until we check you out, right? And so that, and that was, I should not have allowed that to happen, but it was a long time ago. I was much younger. I did not know what I know now. Um, so we're correcting that and, and we're having great success with it. But hell yeah, I would definitely, hey, I wouldn't have sold my 65 Bitcoin for a grand if I was smart. I wanted to ask you about John C. Dvorak so he doesn't give you a hard time on the next ah, No Agenda. There it is. Yes. No Agenda show. John C. Dvorak. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. No problem. Um, how does John C. Dvorak feel about Bitcoin? Um, he's, <laughs> he's a little bit older than you. Like, is, is, does he like Bitcoin or, or how does he feel about it? You have to ask him, but I will say that he definitely influenced my comparison of Bitcoin to Beanie Babies in the beginning. Uh, I don't blame him for tainting my, uh, my view and, uh, and, and, and pushing me into a corner of stupidity. Um, I think he is very mad at himself. <laughs> that, uh, and, but he kind of makes the mistake that a lot of people make. It's like, well, I, I, that train's left the station. No, that has not left the station. You don't have, you know, most people... Don't know. You don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin. You can buy five bucks of Bitcoin on a weekly basis. You know, your dollar cost average, look it up. That'll teach you, you know, it's an investment strategy. It's a saving strategy. Um, and what I really notice, and this is the beauty of it, you know, they say Bitcoin changes you. It's so true because we now have uh, a lot of our, uh, a lot of our wealth in Bitcoin and sometime, from time to time, you know, we may want to make a purchase or we want to send somebody something. I, I, use, I use Bitcoin. My daughter is in uh, the Netherlands. So, it's, you know, to send her a wire transfer. So during the pandemic, all the kids had a rough time. So they need a little bit of cash. Um, and uh, Bitcoin was just a shitload more efficient. You know, it's there within 10 minutes. She can, through bitmymoney dot. NL, she can immediately transfer it through European banking system to her bank, you know, by selling it. Um, so th what that does is that it makes you think twice about your expenditure. You know, so here's, I have, you know, I have some Bitcoin now and it's, it's worth this to me. It's worth this to the market in fiat fund coupons. Um, do I want to spend this right now or do I want to wait? Because if I keep it, it'll go up in value. Is it, so you get your time preference changes and it's a real mind fuck. The same way when I receive Bitcoin, I'm like, oh, this is so cool because I'm receiving it at 30, under $39. This is going to be worth twice as much, perhaps in a year or five years. I don't fucking care when it is. I'm not planning on needing it yet. So like, I'm happy. I, I feel I'm saving, you know, I'm saving again. This is a new thing. It's inverse to the whole credit society. This is really what, what, what changes your mind and you become frugal. And, you know, of course we've had a lot of the, a lot of the whales who had a lot of, you know, early, early money and, you know, we're in very early and I just held on to all kinds of Bitcoin. Um, you know, we've had the Ferrari phase. Okay. That, or Lambo, you know, now, now we're, we're into something else and I'm just seeing this binding factor where, hey man, I'm gonna buy some beef from you. I bought a quarter cow from KNC Cattle in Austin. They're part of the beef initiative that they sell online. You can buy it uh, with Bitcoin. And I feel really good about giving my hard earned, purchased, whatever, Bitcoin to these guys for a bunch of different reasons, but mainly because the value I'm getting back is I went to the ranch, I saw their cows, I saw the pasture, I know what the grass is. This is something I cherish very much. I'm giving to them something, they, their lifeblood. These changes it makes a difference in life and I feel better about it. It's much less, you're still, it's still capitalism, but it doesn't feel like the, uh, it's not as willy nilly, you know, you're, you're much more cognizant, you're much more careful. You have to be, you have to, be careful of your, your Bitcoin. Don't lose your keys. You know, the stuff you got to think about responsibility. It's a very good thing. It feels extremely good as a human to be using it. Does that even answer your question, which I don't remember what it is? 
It was about Dvorak, right? It was about Dvorak and his opinion. Yeah, I think he's Bitcoin. mad and he's pissed at himself. And he doesn't want any Bitcoin. <laughs> wants nothing to do with it. Damn it, I missed out on that one too. I'm horrible. That's probably how he feels. But you should ask him. I, mean, we'll I, I think one of the things that you you, you touched on there about um, the spending, right, and the saving aspect. This is one of the criticisms people have of, and I know Bitcoin's not technically deflationary um, because if we are increasing. Uh, it's not 21 million yet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, there's often often a criticism of Bitcoin. And, and the reason why we have things as we have them is like, oh, you know, uh, if you have it this way, then no one's going to spend and the economy will die. And, and it actually, no, what you've just mentioned is essentially you're going to save and you're going to spend when you should spend and when you actually need to. And you'll actually spend probably extra on things that are decent quality. So mm -hmm. actually what it does is incentivizes a decent economy without people starting businesses thinking it's going great for five years and then completely collapsing because it's built on nothing. But actually it's built on, I want a good like cow on my plate and I know there's a good cow over there. And so I'm going to spend my money on it rather than I'm going to spend my money on McDonald's burgers or whatever. So it's kind of interesting um, how you've just demonstrated a very obvious counter argument to people who kind of get upset at Bitcoin and it's sort of deflationary nature. I say with quote marks for people not seeing um, is exactly what you just said, basically. Um, so I kind of find that interesting. It's kind of like a real world example that you bring up um, of spending Bitcoin and being happy to spend Bitcoin. And it's, it's the connective, it's the connectedness. This is what I noticed. I mean, it's one thing <coughs> for a rancher to get together with ranchers and start something and have an app, whatever, you know, because I can get butcher box, I can get, you know, all kinds of different things, but coming at it from the Bitcoin perspective is like, look, you know how the money works. Are you going to pay me for this? You've done your, your homework. You understand what value is. I've done that over here with beef. And my beef is going to keep you healthy and give you protein. And here's all the education I have for you about beef and why you should be eating this beef. And together we share the knowledge and the depth of knowledge about Bitcoin. And somehow that creates a connective tissue because once I give you Bitcoin, we have a special relationship. It's weird. I'm not quite sure how to explain it. Um, and we see that with the, I mean, the development community around podcasting 2.0 must be 100, 200 people that are hardcore developing one way or the other and they all stick in it i believe because of the bitcoin throw flowing through the system you know everyone gets a little piece of it when so when one person is successful at driving a feature and people use it then all the apps benefit from that you know the hosting companies benefit the podcasters benefit the audiences obviously benefit this this is this is something some connective tissue that is um I mean, just even look at Bitcoin meetups. You know, we're fucking meeting up because of a money. <laughs> it's like, so there's something deeper there. You know, there's not just a money. There's something deeper going on. Going on. Yeah, hundred percent. It does. When someone when I when someone's asked me, you know, to explain Bitcoin to them, I say, look, it's just online digital, you know, cash, peer to peer money. And then I think, so why that? Then you kind of think, well, damn, I am literally going, yes, yeah, so physically to meetups, making podcasts about this, working full time in this, and it's just, it is just money at the end of the day. So it's kind of like a, I feel like almost like I'm a, I'm a hip banker or something. Um, but I suppose there, there is more to it. There is the ideology, and and there is kind of the. Uh, the community that you build and, and this is why it's so important to spend i mean have you have you heard much about or thought much about um these uh free private cities that people are, are looking at and trying to build um that will be so for example there's the obvious one that's not necessarily free private you, but you mean like the citadels yeah so people are making efforts like when i was in el salvador um at the conference there there, there were this essentially companies that were doing exactly that like building specifically like uh you know, towns in certain countries or islands where you literally can and they are actively right. seemingly doing that and it'll be like a bitcoin circular economy like bitcoin town. beach and all that right so yeah mm -hmm. so whereas bitcoin beach is like kind of just you know like slowly growing the, the idea of this will be you know it's going to be uh like we'll have our own laws essentially and it, essentially it's literally just a a walled off like private place with Bitcoin only spending, you, know, you will contribute towards voting for just that town who's in charge, what the laws are, the rules are, all this kind of stuff. And the idea is to kind of get together a group of people who think like-mindedly. So you can have Bitcoiners are an obvious example um, and, and shove them into a town essentially and then see how it goes. Um, it's, it's like the sovereign individual. Have you ever read that book, The Sovereign Individual? I know lots of Bitcoiners course, are into it. Of course. Yeah, like the, like the opt-in government kind of idea where- yeah. 
you know, citizens are going to become sovereign individuals and choose like the jurisdiction they want to participate in. And people are building these like private cities to offer that. Um, well, I, I love the idea. Uh, it may be a little early, uh, but you know, it's, it's like, Hey, when in, uh, in 1999, 2000, I registered databelt.com cause I knew for sure we would have satellites that would be sending internet back and forth, you know, that anyone can dream it up. You put it into into play, I, I think it, it probably needs its own 20 years as we still need to figure out exactly how the money is working, how it's changed us, how our feelings are about that. Um, I do very much like the United States Constitution. So I, I, I think that the, the work went in there to, uh, uh, and everything applies to Bitcoin as far as I can tell. Uh, so, uh, you know, how you govern and how voting works are things that obviously can be improved from from what's happening now in the United States. So I encourage all that. I don't know if if you need the physical proximity. That that to me seems like a, a huge hurdle that would be better solved later on once we have a lot of these things figured out across borders and you know just between ourselves. Once we understand how we're using it and what what we feel comfortable with, and because uh, you know I can see already we're going to have. Well, you remember that town of Bitcoin Gulch? Yep, they had a fork. <laughs> you know, <laughs> all of a sudden, like, oh, wait a minute, they got their own chain over there. I mean, we saw the block wars and everything. I, that would be kind of unfortunate because the nature of people is to is to not agree. Um, so maybe that maybe the physical proximity is a little too too soon. Um, as we you know, we still have tailbones, brother. Yeah, you know, we're this is fucking new to us. So you know, this is uh, we got a lot of human human engineering to do just in our brains, just by learning and consuming and understanding and using. I think before we can really do that effectively, that's just my opinion. I I, I encourage anyone to do it, and I'd love to visit all these towns. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a pretty open view on it. I, 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 yeah, I can. Honestly, I think there's definitely pros and cons, and I think we'll see how it actually happens. It, in actuality because obviously it sounds fantastic from the the good perspective then there's that kind of you know dystopian bad perspective of like you, you have a free private city and then the company that you know helps you form it does it takes control you know i mean there's all these like bad ways it could go and it could be an absolute nightmare um and not to segue too much i guess but you mentioned obviously that you're a fan of like the the constitution and things in the u.s and obviously you because you spent um a fairly good uh, good portion of your life um uh, in in holland um uh growing up there and uh well that was your first uh radio gig it was pirate pirate radio right mm -hmm. um and obviously well to me uh being having gone to amsterdam and other areas in holland quite a few times over my life it it feels like uh, what you see on the tv right now with you know like the police and stuff it feels like a different place to what it did you know two years ago but um what was it what was it like being there because one thing I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by is like the really early stages of like you getting into radio because as a kid i loved i had like an online radio thing and when i was like 13 or whatever i loved radio like how how did you what was the story behind you getting in at the beginning to like doing radio like how, how did that even come about because it feels like it's going to be a bit of like a kind of uh interesting story to me like how do you actually end up getting into this because then you end up going into tv and then it's a whole story from there so like what how, how's the very beginning happened for you growing up in the netherlands and, and i've only really only really learned about seven years ago when i turned 15 like this is just what i do uh, I, I, for some reason, I like to broadcast and I always get involved at the technology level first for some odd reason. So when I was 13, uh, I was living in the Netherlands and it was a very socialist country. It still technically is. Um, and they had just like, you know, like the BBC, you know, you had your, your government, uh, stations and there was really no commercial radio or television. It was very limited. Um, and uh, I was always tinkering around with stuff with electronics and lights and batteries. And uh, my parents gave me for Christmas 101 projects in one. I still have it. Um, and it was all these components on a breadboard. And you had you connected them with wires, with color-coded wires. And you had a little booklet with 101 projects. And you could build all these different things. And you could see how the components work. And in the back was an FM transmitter. I'm like, holy shit, we built this. So I built the FM transmitter, quickly learned antenna technology, you know, for, oh, okay, it's broadcasting to the radio, but it won't go very far, learned amplifying technology, et cetera. And then, of course, as you're testing, you, you want to test, but you can't be walking outside with a radio. So I 
hooked up a record player, record player, and, you know, put the needle on the record, uh, let it run. And then my mom actually would drive me around the block and we'd see how far it would reach. And my parents were very, very cool about that. They let me put antennas on the roof, all kinds of wacky shit. At least I wasn't into drugs and drinking. And I liked, I think with a lot of motorcycles. And so again, you know, technology. Um, and uh, it wasn't long. Actually, we came back from one of those trips around the neighborhood and some kids were like, hey man, we hear your, we hear your radio station. I'm like, oh, okay. So then I built a mixer, got a second recorder uh, a record player and uh, in a microphone and and started working on my voice which sounded very different and i would r- literally like work on the just getting this low voice you know i was in this time like 14 15 um and then from there there was an ad in a paper a local paper for a hospital closed circuit radio station which you know very captive audience and not going anywhere so they literally would have three socialist radio channels and the fourth one which was radio tulipa in the Tulip Hospital in uh, south of Amsterdam. And so we do, a sh- I do, and I got hired. My parents said, I, you have to be 16, but you can go ahead and lie about your age. And, you know, and so I got a gig as an engineer. I failed as a host initially. And um, so there was a, like a full-on real professional radio studio, like with a big board and, and quick start turntables and all this stuff. I'm like, oh, man. So I just, every week, cause, you know, yeah, we did our shows, but, it was, I learned a lot about audiences, but I, could, I had the key so I could go in after school and just play and, and learn and do stuff. And then I met a guy who was working at a pirate radio station in Amsterdam, Decibel Radio. And these guys, they were playing Chicago Warehouse songs, you know, while the, the socialist radio stations were playing polka music. And that was the top 40. So, and Lawrence Welk and shit. So like, holy crap. And so I started there doing a show on Saturday night in, in English as an American. Of course, Amsterdam is an international city. And I had worked on my voice so much that people really believed that John Holden, which was my on-air name, because, you know, it was illegal, so you didn't want to put your own name out there, um, was a black guy, probably in his 20s, and definitely rode a Harley. So I kept up this uh, persona, and it was great. I mean, it was, fa- it was fantastic, and I really learned radio audiences interacting with audiences um what audiences like i mean what 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 a hit is how you can pick a hit i learned so much went to college for a few months to study communications fucking hated it everyone there was like hey how much can we drink how much can we smoke how fast can we drive i'm like no no no. i'm i want to be on the radio i was running the radio station there on on campus within two months so i dropped out um, just started sending letters. And then by chance, uh, Veronica radio and television, they said, uh, well, we don't have a, t- a radio gig for you, but we had our host of our TV show is leaving for a competitor. We want you to host countdowns, big music show, um, next week. So I started doing that and television was never really my thing, but they also gave me radio next to that. And then MTV called, asked me to move to New York. I'm doing a quick v- version of it. And once I was in New York, I immediately got on WHTZ, Z100. Scott Shannon was one of my my idols. Um, I did a syndicated radio show, always done radio next to everything I was doing. And then the internet came. And and I saw the internet. I'm like, oh, man, one day I'll be broadcasting on this shit for sure. But it was still early days, dial-up modem. So I actually left MTV to start a company. um, And I would build some of the biggest early consumer websites, Continental Airlines, Budweiser, um, gosh, I mean, uh, Reebok, you name it. We had tons and tons of, of big corporate websites, took that company public on NASDAQ, and then, uh, and then kind of semi-retired and didn't really, and you know, kept building things until podcasting kind of hit. But it was always radio, always wanting to build studios at home, and you know, now I'm actually working with several hardware and software manufacturers on creating creating a better podcast box because all this shit that comes out now sucks. So you know, I'm I'm. It's just what I do. It's just radio. Uh, I don't really like video at all. Um, um, and I just want to make podcasting better and more secure. And uh, and I need it too because uh, my income is based on it. So I can't have shit falling away or breaking either. Since you brought it back to podcasting, how closely did you guys work with like the Sphinx Chat or or Breeze Wallet guys, um, in order for them to like implement 
the the streaming payments and stuff in, into their Lightning wallets? Very good question. Um, so I had I had figured out the streaming stuff. I had figured out how KeySend would work in Lightning, and we set up a Mastodon. So on the Fediverse uh, podcast index social, and uh, Paul Ito uh, Itoy showed up from uh, from Sphinx, and he said, "Oh, dude." Dude, dude, he said, dude, dude, we can we can integrate this right away. And you know, and we talked for hours and we had great conversations. And we implemented the first um streaming for streaming. Actually, the boost uh, was their idea, um, the boost button. Um, and you know, they tied into our API. And I think what happened there, so I'm very appreciative of uh of Paul and the whole team, which is always a side project for their company. We kind of blew them up. Because it became so successful, there was so many sat streaming everywhere that their model of everyone has a small node, they just couldn't scale it as far as I could tell. Um, And they uh, helped a lot with uh, the early innovation. And then they just kind of dropped off the radar. You know, they don't, they're doing something different. They have a different plan and I can't blame them. I do miss them. Uh, because they were super fun, uh, especially with their uh, Sphinx tribes. It was really a great system, but a little bit of ahead of its time. Um, you know, right now we're still kind of in the custodial situation for podcast wallets, and they really had a non-custodial, which was a phenomenal system. Not really appropriate for the the amount of transact. If you go to um, gopodcasting.org, um, you will see a a map of all of the nodes for podcasting 2.0. And you'll see very quickly how it can mess up balances, et cetera. So, um, uh, so that was uh, uh, Sphinx. Then Roy called me from Breeze and he said, look, um, I'm interested in, uh, in putting podcasting into my wallet which is exactly, I knew that we'd either have, we'd have podcast develop, app developers who need to learn how to put wallets in or do something. And then hopefully I said, we'd have uh, wallet apps who want to put podcasting in. And that's what Roy did. And I convinced him that it was the right way to go. And I think he would agree that it was strategically a, a very, very uh, wise move. And they have been the most solid, most advanced partner when it comes to integrating it with Lightning Network. We're now seeing uh, other apps who are taking advantage of uh, some custodial solutions, which is obviously not ideal, um, but it's a start. And they're excelling quite a bit on the podcasting features front. So, you know, if I've learned anything, it takes years. Podcasting is a slow grinder. It just chugs ahead. And then all of a sudden you get these little moments and some something happens, just like podcasting 1.0 when serial hit the market at exactly when everybody was all binged out on shit. And now, oh, here's something really cool I can listen to, but I can't find out what happens next. I have to wait a whole week. And that built some kind of anticipation. That was a beautiful moment in podcast history timeline. Um, You know, just as Joe Rogan to Spotify is also a great, although technically not great for podcasting, it is great for podcasting. And he has spawned many other podcasts through people who have been on his show, people who he's influenced, but it's a slow grind. Joe didn't appear out of nowhere. He was doing it for over, over a decade. You know, this stuff takes time and so do features in the industry, but we have, uh, we have critical mass and network effect. So now it's just the flywheel spinning, just try to add more more fuel to the fire yeah it's just, it's astonishing the quality of some content that's on podcasts uh like i remember listening to serial for the first time and i was like holy shit like i didn't i didn't pay for this like you know i mean like i, I didn't buy i it's almost like you imagine like i didn't buy a cd that was like 40 pounds on amazon and came in some box that 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 like would give me this experience that i'm expecting to get from this right um it's kind of amazing and then with joe rogan as well like the uh the the, the fame he's got and the sound quality that he has and the sound quality that you have as well on, on your podcast um it's kind of astonishing like uh to think that only i don't know go back just over a decade maybe 15 years ago or whatever um you didn't have bitcoin didn't exist at all uh, and podcasting audio quality just wasn't quite as good and, and and people hadn't um quite like nailed the idea of like what things like serial did and like kind of these episodic kind of uh it hadn't quite gone to that yet it felt like it still was like quite experimental and it felt more like radio on 
like a like an hour of radio or whatever when someone released the podcast a, a little bit more than you know almost like a soprano style tv show but on the podcast mm-hmm. um so i guess it's gonna be interesting to see and i think podcasting will survive for quite a long time um many 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 years to come it's just gonna be interesting to see the direction it goes in and hopefully as you say i think people aren't quite ready yet to uh have complete custody of like their own uh well, they their own crypto first off. I mean, the amount of people that keep their Bitcoin and Coinbase and Binance, et cetera. Um, but then they are, they also, I feel like people on mass aren't quite ready to like learn to actually just pay for good content on like a you know per minute per second basis. Um, and I wonder what massive event is going to make people be ready for that, I suppose. Um, like, is there going to be something that finally pushes people over the edge to realize that, you know, actually we, we can't, uh, maybe the cancelling of the wrong person, I don't know, is, is going to be the thing that makes people suddenly realise that they need to start you know, doing things themselves and, and spending a little bit here and there. Um, well, I, I am a, what's known as a doomer optimist. So I'm boomer adjacent. I consider myself Gen X. Um, I know that we have a very bumpy road ahead, not just in the United States, but everywhere. Shit's going to come crumbling down. We're, we have to rebuild parallel networks to institutions we just can't trust anymore. They're too corrupt. It's the decentralization of everything. Thank you, Silicon Valley, for helping to show us the way. Every day, more and more people go, well, hold on a second. Why is that gone? Why is that gone? Why is that deep power? Why can't I say this? Why do I have this warning? Oh, it turns out what I couldn't say two months ago turns out to be true now. So people are not stupid. The governing elites of the world think we're stupid. And, and they do, they live on a different, a different level in their heads. And it's, I've, I've been at their parties. Um, so they are helping to move people towards the Fediverse. They're helping to, now, sure, people like, oh, let's go to Getter because they, they won't deplatform me there. Yes, they will. Anything that's centralized, people are learning the centralized nature. Just like podcasting in a way is like Linux, you know, That motherfucker crept onto the desktop over 30 years in the making. You know, it's taken a long time. But I I use Linux as Linux Mint actually is my daily driver. More and more people are walking away from Microsoft. Hey, why do I have to give all my uh, up to am I vaccinated before I can use uh, Windows 11? I mean, it's almost that bad. And it's tracking you and people are catching up to that. And Apple is actually helping by making people aware of course, they're, they're trapped in their Apple cage, but you know, they're making people aware of the tracking. So this is pushing people uh, away from the traditional systems. And what I'm delighted to see, and I, I've seen pro- many projects like this. I go back to the Cobalt Cube. I don't know if anyone is old enough to remember that, but look it up, Cobalt, C-O-B-L-T-E, Cube, Q-U-B-E. That was one of the original Linux home servers. It was a blue box. It had rack mounts later, and it had email server. It had you know a storage. It had um, you know you could you could mount a drive. Um, it connect. It, I think it, it might have even had a Wi-Fi point at some in some version. And so that was kind of that's actually where podcasting stemmed from. Is you need a buffering server in your closet that collects your media you know now we have media servers so we had this has all started to creep in it's very lots of people are creating home media servers now thank you raspberry pi for bringing us the beauty of this cheap machine so now we have umbral and i think umbral has a real shot at bringing it all together so it, if anyone's not familiar with umbral it's often sold as a full bitcoin lightning node but it has an app store, a very familiar concept for people. Now, you can build your own on a Raspberry Pi. You can buy one from bitcoinmachines.com, I think. Um, it's still going to be four or 500 bucks, but you can install Next Office on it. Oh, hold on a second. I just solved a whole bunch of problems. I don't need Microsoft Office anymore. You know, I have, I've been running Nextcloud for, for several years, you know, so now, and it, it's all over Tor. So you don't have to punch holes in your firewall. Now that does give you some restrictions with some things you can do, but in general, as a home server, just for calendar, email, file storage, uh, notes, I mean, it's a great platform. Um, And then all the other apps that are coming out. So we now have launched Helipad, which is now also on the Umbral app store. And if you use your Umbral as your Bitcoin, uh, as your uh, podcasting, uh, podcaster wallet, 
you can actually fire up helipad and you can see the boosts as they come in and you can see the messages can i just screen share with you guys will that show up does that make yeah. i mean i know it's yeah, not great for yeah. the uh, for the listening audience i just want to show you what this looks like hold on a second i'll bring it up go for it let me uh let me share screen um so this would be the one share the screen okay you see this yeah we got gotcha. you helipad boost tracker so this is 3,300 sats, came in for the podcast, Podcasting 2.0, episode 71. And here's the message. Ha, 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 Content by nickname from Kass Peeland. Um, now, these are some more sats. Um, I still haven't here. caught an episode of Curry and the Keeper yet. Oh, you, you're missing out, brother. Um, here's, look at this. 50,000 sats from Abel Kirby. Today's numbers, what is that? 20 bucks? Mo Facts with Adam Curry, episode 74. Love the show, guys. Can't get the ringles and blah, blah, blah. So here, here's 50,000 sats for Curry and the Keeper. I mean, this, this is money that people are transmitting to me, and I am receiving at home on my own node because they're just listening to my podcasts. Look at all this shit. I mean, this is insane when you really... Here's another 50,000 sat boost. This is real money that's taking place here. Now, and anybody can do this. Anybody. Uh, and it's as simple as, um, well, actually, oh, okay. Let's, since we're, since we're crazy, let's just do the whole thing. Shall we? This'll be fun. So we'll do, uh, I'm going to use uh, curio caster just to make it easy. Thank you for indulging me in this. I know the listening audience that you can cut this out of the regular podcast. Um, uh, we'll, we'll keep it in. They can then come and watch yeah, it. They can watch it's it on YouTube. Fault. Okay, yeah. so I'll, I'll take the curry and the keeper. This is one that I do my, with my wife. Now, we started this. It's only five episodes. We do it every 14 days. We started it as only podcasting 2.0 podcast, and it's completely different from anything else I do. So it's, we think it's entertaining, but we wanted to see if we could have people support it. So what I'll do now is you see, this is uh, right now I'm streaming 100 sats per minute uh, to this podcast. Here's how many sats I have in my wallet, the 11,194. Now I'm going to send a boost. I'm going to hold it down to do a boost a gram. So I'm going to send uh, a row of ducks for, uh, what, oops, two, 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 two. There we go. Now I can send it to everybody or I can select who I, this is the, the split I was talking about. There's Dreb does the chapters. I like to give a percentage to Curio Caster because it makes my RSS. This is my home node, the Boostergram monitor. And here's the, the majority of this will go to podcast. Uh, no, I'm sorry. The majority goes to the Boostergram monitor. One percent goes to podcast index and another percent goes to Curio Cast. We're going to send it to everybody from Adam and uh, say hi, bit refill. Okay. And I'll just hit this. Now you see the boost is sent. Now to go That's back, awesome. I should have. I should have opened up the, uh, hopefully the demo works. It's amazing to see how just what you've done so far amazing. works. So yeah. it's pretty user oh, friendly, on. right? There it is. Boom. Two, 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 two sats from Adam. Say hi, bit refill. So that went, yeah, it went from my computer I'm using to show you this. But there's no real connection, you know? I never had to register anything. All that, all that is done is is everything knows where it lives and it's sent it over Tor right into my house and boom, there it is. It also has a cool pew pew sound, but I forgot to turn up the, uh, I forgot to turn up the volume. Um, okay, so let's, uh, how do I stop this and go back? Oh, stop share. There you go. So that, there it is. Awesome. It, it, it's a round trip, you know? And by the way, uh, boosting yourself, it's I think illegal in 37 states. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, we will, we will not do that. Oh, Jerry's finally arrived. Jerry, you hey, see Jerry. Market. All right. It's been an amazing podcast. That, um, but I have you know, a few off, you know, off topic questions, although we are running short of time. Um, the pandemic, or, or some will say clandemic or scandemic, um, which side you know, are you leaning? Like, I'd like to get you know, your point of view. From from what you've been saying, I know from lots of what you said, I, I kind of figured out that you know um, that you're not too amused with all that's been happening. But um, 
something that has me curious is where at what point do you feel like um like they they everything they say can't be all lies so where you know where do people draw the line i was discussing with a friend and he said that I told him, like, you know, all this seems, all, all that's happening seems too, you know, coordinated, seems too fishy. And I think the whole vaccine, it, it's, it's all, you know, it's all a scam, really. And he said, um, and, you know, they're forcing people to do stuff. And he, and he said something like, if they don't force people that, you know, the whole, the whole hospital beds, the beds are filled up and, uh, you know, and there's no space. So people have to get vaccinated or they, so they don't get sick. And the truth is, I really didn't have, you know, a counter for that you know, line of thought. And, Maybe because I don't have all the data, but I'd like to get views on your perspective on that. What What do you think? Through my work with No Agenda, uh, right from the get go, when the the briefing started uh, with President Trump and uh, the team, Fauci and uh, Burke, uh, Burke, whatever her name is, and Redfield and all these people, I really started diving in, and the numbers didn't make sense pretty quickly. I've I've done a lot of analysis of computer modeling, computer modeling that is typically used in climate change. So I have a lot of questions about that. But more importantly, I believe that we, the world has not a health problem, but a financial problem. And if you look back at the timeline before this started, we had several important uh, financial events with uh, the central banks, uh, the world's central banks all came up with a plan called going direct and they needed to do this because the balance sheet and I, I i cannot explain how it works with federal reserve dollars and dollars in the real world but i think we all understand money printer go burr and the overnight repos had gone out of control before all of this hit 2019 there were trillions of dollars being lent not overnight but for 14 days for and this was the amounts of money was higher than the uh, than the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. There was clearly something very bad. The concept uh, of going direct meant that we had to not only do what we've been doing, which is uh, buying bonds and investing this printed money into the stock market, which is, you know, that's what quantitative easing is. Um, in addition, we also had to get money to people directly. We had to have a way to, to send people money to get it off the, the Federal Reserve side of the balance sheet into the real world. And, that, and, and the reasons for that is otherwise it, the system just stopped. I think we were in a very similar system to 2008, 2009, which we were never really cleaned up. That bullshit is still with us. Um, and when you have a problem like that with the financial system, there's a couple of choices you have, but one that was very obvious is like, so, you know, inflation is on one, it's, it's not only uh, true inflation, so not the consumer price index or whatever extra you're paying for beef or gas, but true inflation as in printing of money, inflating the money supply um, is really measured not only by how much uh, was created, but also by the velocity of money, how fast are people holding it, how fast they want to get rid of it. Well, a great way to slow that down is to just shut down the fucking economy. And that's what they did. Now, did they do that using something as an excuse that may not have been quite as bad as maybe it was more flu-like and a lot of anxiety and poor, uh, poor protocols or wrong protocols? You know, God knows, because there's too many factions and these, these groups kind of swarm through each other and come together. So you have the pharmaceutical seeing an opportunity and obviously they were right because, you know, look at the numbers, 80, $90 billion annual, uh, annual, uh, turnover. And I think even profit to some degree, um, they took advantage of that, but really it feels to me like we have a problem with the money system. We need to get money to people direct, shut everything down. Let's make sure no small business works. I and mean, these are the things that bothered me. Shut down small business, but not big business. Um, okay, um, uh, if you're poor and you work at the big box, then you're then you're you know, then you're a frontline worker. Yay, go for you. We're going to clap for you. You know all of this stuff. Then the constant changes. I mean, without arguing the true merits of 
vaccine. I'm not vaccinated. Happy to tell you that. I'm glad I waited because now all the things I was tracking turns out to be true. It certainly doesn't stop you from getting sick transmission. We have some bullshit metric says you'll get less sick. Okay, fine. Um, it's looking more and more like there was a lot of chicanery going on with, with the analysis, with treatments, the lack of actual health explanations, what you can do to stay healthy. None of that was in place. I've spoken to enough people. I, I totally feel that everything was wrong about that, probably for profit, more likely for control. Um, it, 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 it created a, um, uh, a mass uh, hysteria, a global mass hysteria amongst, you know, more severe amongst a smaller group, but it, it's definitely there. People have been freaking out. In the meantime, they've had a lot of chances to figure out what are we going to do. If you look at what's happening, certainly with the Federal Reserve, there's a lot of shenanigans. They're hiring all kinds of very weird characters to oversee banking, to oversee banking uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, the Federal uh, Insurance Deposit Agency has been captured. So there's some kind of banking takeover uh, in place. And I believe that ultimately the idea is, and that always was, but Trump probably came in and fucked it up and it wasn't supposed to happen now when things weren't ready. This was probably supposed to happen four years from now under President Hillary Clinton's uh, you know, final, final term. Um, where we move to the central bank digital currency, where we lock in the full control of the human race by saying, okay, no more retail banking. You now get your CBD, you know, your central bank digital currency. It's your digital dollar. Make sure you watch all the right Netflix shows because then we will give you a bonus at the end of the month. Universal basic income. All of this is happening. It's unstoppable from their perspective. I believe we can and we are checking out of that and saying, no, fuck you very much. We're going to do our thing over here and we'll see how you do with that. Um, uh, so again, to recap, this was a financial problem. It's no different than World War I, World War II. What do you do after these big events, which seem to come kind of spaced out in the same amount of time? You re configure the world, you reconfigure the supply chains, you reconfigure the money, you reconfigure power. And now we're coming out of this. Pharmaceuticals would love to keep us in. They have their own reasons. Uh, there may be all kinds of bullshit in this. It, to me, it's not a, a traditional vaccine, so I'm not comfortable with even contemplating some kind of gene therapy that's being sold as, you know, as a, as a traditional system. Um, uh, they have their own agenda. It can fit in perfectly. I think ultimately we have lost uh, paper money and coin money. That's gone because, you know, oh my God, COVID is sticking on your money. You can get sick. Said the newspaper, who would you actually get the newspaper? You won't get sick from grabbing the newspaper to read about how the money will make you sick. Um, we lost that. And um, I would say that. Um, uh, we lost some 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 control. You know, uh, the con the QR code was dead. This fucker came back and is now alive, and it is now your pass to living. And this is how it's being used: uh, Austria, Germany, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, you know, now strangely enough, the UK is like, whoop, we're all gone, but not really. They still have their their pass thing. This is the pass is going to be with us. Maybe some testing. You know that they'll try and keep that regime going. But that's all for control, and and everybody in the world needs to vote out every politician who is currently sitting. I think they're all pieces of shit. They've taken us down this path. They're either captured or they want to be captured. Um, uh, and the bottom line is financial. This was not a health crisis. We have a health crisis. We're eating shit. You just Adam. walk through the supermarket. You're eating processed food. You know. Adam, in light of all this, um, how do you feel about this guy in El Salvador that seems to kind of be standing up like the one politician in the world that is trying to improve the lives of his people by um, allowing them to adopt Bitcoin with the uh, legal tender law and then also kind of publicly saying he's doing it to get out from under the thumb of the IMF? Well, I don't know Bukele, I don't know Bukele personally. Um, I know people who do and uh, it seems like he has the right idea. You know, this is a millennial. 
And this is exactly what the millennials should be doing. How, will, it, if, will it work in the way he's doing it? Um, I love that he's kicking against the establishment. I think it gives us a real opportunity. You know, I speak to friends who are from Panama and like, oh, El Salvador, oh, okay, blah, we'll see what happens. But it, it's getting out there. And I loved his, his tweet from the other day, which was, there's only, there's 50 million millionaires in the world. There's only 21 million Bitcoin. Even if every single one of these millionaires wanted one Bitcoin, only half of them could get it if they could get it. So he's clearly pressuring the market, trying to create some upward momentum, uh, which I don't think he has to do. Uh, but I do love the steps he's taken. And we'll see, you know, these early projects, they may not work as well as we hope. It may be too early. I don't know. I would hate for it to be held up as a shining example of failure if it does fail. So we have to be kind of nuanced and careful. But um, anyone who, uh, who believes that Bitcoin can fix things and create a better, more honest monetary future, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan. Absolutely. Why wouldn't I be? That's crazy. We, anyone who wants to change some shit, I'm there. Interestingly, as well, you mentioned uh, like the issue with food, and and one thing that uh, I saw it was an El Salvadorian advert for COVID, and instead of just saying about the vaccine, um, it was essentially talking about get outside and exercise, support each other, eat healthy food, and I was like, oh, finally, an advert that actually <laughs> like actually seems to be asking us to do something somewhat useful to make us healthy. Uh, it's yes. kind of astonishing that we haven't had that from anywhere else, um, and also the the constant kind of. It, well, it feels strange to me as well, especially in like the UK, is this idea of like, uh, oh, you know, uh, we've got like a care crisis because we fired basically everyone in care who didn't want to get vaccinated. Um, but it's not because we did that. It's actually because they didn't get vaccinated. That's the problem. So if they'd all got vaccinated, it all would have been fine. And it like, this makes no sense. It's like you're saying one thing and then com <laughs> like completely like such well, confusing. Well, logic. look at it. I mean, I've also learned to take people at their word. You know, I used to say Council on Foreign Relations. Yeah, it's a drinking club. The World Economic Forum you got to take these fuckers at their word. They're saying great reset. Well, you can't reset until you've destroyed something. So I think there's, I, I get a lot of emails. So there's a United Airlines pilot and she's been a pilot for 32 years, 32 years at United Airlines. She refuses to get vaxxed. And she says, hey, I've seen them pull pilots out of the cockpit, heart attack, dead, passed out, whatever. This is not in the news. It's happening regularly. She says, I don't want it. Um, there, there are pilots who are saying, I feel fine, but they have chest pains when they're flying. There's all kinds of bullshit going on. The elites don't want, I mean, if you heard uh, our uh, transportation secretary, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, he said, so he now has more than a trillion dollars from this infrastructure bill. And he says, his first big speech is, we're going to make our goal zero deaths in traffic. And I'm thinking, holy shit, well, what's your plan? Well, the only plan that can create so-called zero deaths is if it's all self-driving. So they want self-driving, they want self-flying, they don't give a shit about pilots, but uh, it looks to me like the CEO of United Airlines is purposely trying to destroy his airline. He's big friends with the Democratic Party and with the current president. Um, I'm seeing destructive behavior everywhere. What the hell is wrong with Germany? Germany has closed all their coal plants. They've cold, uh, they have six remaining nuclear plants. They've closed down three of those. Three more will be closed by the end of this year. And now everyone's surprised why the price of natural gas, which you need when wind isn't blowing and sun isn't shining, why it's now spiked to five, six times the price. That can only be because they want to commit some kind of harakiri or break it down so that we can build it up with a new solution, which they have ready. It's a new society. It's green. It's electric. Um, the electricity is created magically, although I suspect it will be nuclear. Look at the investments Bill Gates is making. They all know. They all know this doesn't work. You need, you need some other base load that's there all the time that you can count on when you, know, you have a lack of renewable resources, which is you know, a misnomer by itself. Um, so... I think they're destroying it. And I, I hate to say it, but that's what it looks like to me. They're just fucking destroying everything. They're destroying the financial markets. They're destroy, destroying the financing of government bonds. They're destroying small business. They're destroying um, uh, education, destroying trust in media, destroyed what was left. I mean, all of this shit is happening around us and it's happening to you guys. 
you know, it's like, I'm okay. I'm going to be okay. I live 90 miles outside of Austin. I got three acres. I got a dog. I'm happy. You know, I got my beef. <laughs> um, but, you know, to, to be able to live life and live it normally without all of this bullshit, we have some fight, some fighting left to do and some things we should not accept. You know, we should not accept some shit. I'm, I'm really proud of Canada right now, but also very worried because Trudeau, with the stance he's taking, really only has a couple options. One, he can wait until everyone's tired and goes home, which they don't seem to. I mean, I think the level of, of frustration is so high, people aren't going to leave. Um, he can beat them, which is what they did in Amsterdam. You saw it. Fucking, I, I grew up in this country. They were putting dogs on people, beating old people with sticks. It's shocking to me. Um, or they could fucking drop all the mandates. There's a novel idea. We'll see which one he chooses. I'm very, very worried. I don't see number three happening ever. I don't really either, man. But I, you saw it in the UK, which is probably Boris Johnson just trying to save Panicking. his ass from party gate and whatever. You know? And <laughs> they still hate him for Brexit. So he's on, that guy's he's dead man walking, really. But, you know, the, he, that was his Hail Mary, I guess. Yeah, I think his is a desperate, desperate PR change, uh, basically. PR stunt, sorry. Yeah. Um, no, it's 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 definitely interesting. I mean, I, I'd love to disagree with you to create a more engaging podcast, but I don't think I can. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't think Impossible. I can. Um, I mean, I've, I had two doses of the vaccine. And after the first one, I reacted very badly, passed out after the first uh, dose, uh, just randomly, like a couple of minutes afterwards, fine, and then poof. And after that, I was really nervous about getting the second one, but I wanted to be able to travel, so I just got it, got out, but... I can't see myself getting the third one, to be honest. Uh, I think I'm drawing the line at this point. Uh, I, I did what I had to do to, 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 to leave uh, and get some elements of freedom. And now I'm kind of like... Uh, well, you're, sure you're, you're, you're actually... Uh, I consider you to be very brave. Uh, and anyone who has taken the vaccine, uh, be, uh, you know, you're, ta you're making a conscious decision, uh, which has risks, and you took a, a calculated risk for yourself. And I would say you're actually pretty fucking brave. Um, I, I, I would also say for sure, consider not taking it any further because, you know, the more information we have seems like, you know, it just may not be that beneficial to you. Um, but yeah, you know, yeah. uh, th again, I mean, the, the number of times I've received email from someone saying, dude, it's like, I'm at the bottom here. I have to choose either. I accept the vaccine into my life or I can't feed my family. These are brave people who 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 make these choices if that's the last thing they have that's literally that's brave so i have i have nothing against that um i do have tons of issues about the whole procedure and everything and how it's gone and i mean right down to um how the jab itself happens we don't even aspirate needles anymore which is i didn't didn't know was a thing you know you're supposed to stick it in pull it out make sure there's no blood so you're not going into a vein and then you continue. They don't even teach that anymore. So there's a lot of things in medicine in general that I have a real problem with. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the pharmaceutical companies just have to be either completely ignored or shut down or whatever, or just gone around because I, you can't even afford health insurance anymore. It's a, the whole system is, is a big scam, a ripoff. And, um, and so you have to question everything. And, and I think that level of control makes me very sad. You know, you want to travel. I know. I understand. I can't travel to places I want to go. It's my choice, but I'm really not happy with it. I, I can't see my daughter, you know, as an example. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty messed up. I, uh, I hope the things change. I know that in the UK, I think we're moving testing, but I think it's only for vaccinated. So, yeah, we'll see over the next six months, maybe, as to how things go once, uh, once the Northern Hemisphere gets summer. Uh, my hope is that, or, or even, you know, as, as, as cynical as I sound, you know, if we have a invasion in the Ukraine or, or if that like goes up and up and up, maybe that will just get into the news and people will, uh, this is the other thing I wonder if some massive war happens and I know it's I'm not hoping for a war by any means or anything like that. Definitely not hoping for it. Um, but if it did happen, how quickly am I, this is what I said to, to my friend today, like how quickly would, would COVID be forgotten about if some big, you know, thing happened would, within a month, I feel like everyone would be right as rain walking around outside. And I think it'd be within 48 months. hours. Yeah, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, people who are absolutely terrified now of leaving the house will probably be out of their house because once something's out of your mind and not constantly being talk, spoken to you about, then you just forget about it and that's it. I mean, it's, you know, it it's, really, it's really interesting uh, living in Texas, you know, so I was in Austin for 11 years, a very liberal blue dot on the, on the Texas map. 
And uh, and I I really was not happy with the direction the city was taking. It was becoming a tech mecca, which I didn't need to experience again, having been in San Francisco. Um, they let homelessness run rampant, a whole bunch, all for political reasons. So we decided to move out. And we're 90 miles west in the hill country. It's like night and day. It is like night and fucking day. I mean, there is no fear. There's no talk about it. Oh, yeah, my crew's got the Rona, so I, I'll come three days later. These, these, you know, it's like, yeah, they'll be home, they'll come back. The, um, you want to wear a mask? You wear a mask all you want. Wear a garbage bag on your head. No one cares, and do whatever you want to do. I'm not doing it. Um, it's very, very different life here, and that just shows you that once you don't have the messaging, once you don't have all of the, you know, the placards on the windows, all of this bullshit, it's very easy to, uh, to forget. It's very easy to get out of that headspace. Now, uh, regarding war, I can tell you Ukraine is a big joke. It's a big, uh, it's, it's a big distraction. Uh, the real shit that's going on is in the Baltic, in the Baltic Sea. That's where the moves are being made. The Arctic, this is totally about access to the Arctic, which, where Russia has, has tons of bases, where Russia and China are cooperating. If you read 1984, the, I think the first line in the book is, We've always been at war with Eurasia. Well, lo and behold, I mean, it's crazy to think of, you know, uh, Huxley's Brave New War World in 1984. Um, there's so many examples of things that are just fucking coming true. And um, the war with Eurasia seems like another one. You know, China and Russia, they are, they're being pushed. We are, the United States is literally pushing them towards each other. And then we get this all of a sudden Kazakhstan. See, I like looking at maps. If you look at Kazakhstan, that fucker's in between Russia and China is going to be one of the most important belt and road train routes. This was, this was us, no doubt about it. Um, saying, oh, no, oh, we're going to disrupt that. You, you're not going to have that. By the way, Kazakhstan, that's where all um, the Russian rockets are sent up from. You know, this is not, this is not, not separate from Russia. You know, the Kazakhstan is important. And this connection with China, we literally said, go fuck yourself. You can't play with China, you know, which means, okay, fuck you. I'm going to go play with China. We're doing stupid shit. So that may be part of it that we have, you know, these factions, Eurasia, we're always at war with them. It won't be kinetic. It'll be cyber. You know, uh, and, and, and who knows? I mean, we're going to see the Texas grid will go down again. It'll be blamed initially on Russia then on domestic violent extremists who, oh, you heard the reports maybe? Yes, domestic violent extremists are going to take down, uh, they're going to take down the, the power grid. Yes, this is a warning from intelligence. Come on, people. You know, so there's too many shenanigans going on in our world. Um, so heads down, build the networks, keep, keep your shit straight, keep safe. Um, get a dog, get, learn how to use a gun, <laughs> get some Bitcoin, get some beef. You know, these are the things that we had and, and physical meetups, meeting people physically is still very important. If you can, that's a really big deal. Yeah. Physical meetups is a, is a big key. Um, that's something that, uh, I was trying to do in London before I came over to Brazil. Um, and it's a massive, massive thing. It's like, it makes people realize they're not alone in something then, you know, and it kind of, yes, sir. It's, a, it's a healthy, a healthy thing to do for sure. Especially after so many years of not doing it. Um, well, Hey, like I, uh, we've, we've ran, uh, over time and I don't want to, you know, uh, take up too much of your time. So, uh, well, can, I, probably... can I just ask Jerry, if I answered yeah. his question, if he had any feedback on, you know, and I'm just in general, I'm curious about Nigeria and what people are thinking. If it's, if the general consensus is. This is a scamdemic, pandemic. Do they blame the U.S.? Do they blame China? You got sh China's in your fucking backyard. So I'd like to know what what your what your stance is. In Nigeria, it's pretty. Uh, I think no one cares. It's like uh, how do I put it? Uh, the people are poor, so everybody's just you know basically trying to survive, and and no one cares if you know this. You know and. It's a religious, religious country. Like everybody's very, very people are very. Um, how do I put it? They they think it's all you know, Antichrist, you know, mark of the beast and stuff mark like that. Mark of the that. beast, and, sure. Revelations, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So they do not. They do not. Some people are very skeptical. So obviously they're not going to you know think much about it and say it's, it's something you know that has to do with the devil. And most people are just like, man, who cares? Like, like me personally, I like. I think I think I've had COVID, you know, once, and it just felt, you know, like a nuisance. 
And for most people who've had you know similar symptoms, it's the same. It's like it uses that, you know, that just goes away after three or four days. Like nobody's there's no fear mongering, there's no there's no fear. Everybody's just living their life. And it's it's quite surprising because the forecast um, forecast from the UN, you know, projections say, oh, and lots of people are going to die in Africa and Nigeria, stuff like that. It's like there's you can ask like 10,000 people or 5,000 people, 1,000 people, and nobody can tell you, like, I actually know somebody that died from COVID-19. Really? Really? Yeah. You can go, like, you might have, I heard someone, someone got sick, or you see on TV, on the news, the same thing, on the news, like, you know, 1,000 cases or 1,000 deaths or 500 deaths, but you nobody actually knows anybody that's gotten sick or actually died, you know, from COVID-19. So... There's just like, you know, people are dying, but, you know, since there's no reporting and nobody actually knows, but that's not the case. Nobody actually can point to actually one person or the other person that says, ah, a friend of mine, an uncle of mine died. It's always I've heard about or someone told me, but there's no actual, you know, first person experience, you know, if you get what I mean. so, So that tells me a couple of things, and I appreciate that. It tells me, one, that, you know, the words were never truer. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. I believe the fear that was instilled in most Western societies was so severe that it almost had a nocebo effect, you know, like, oh my God, I've got the Rona, I'm going to die. And you know what? You can kill yourself. You can, you can make yourself very, very sick. The, so probably the propaganda uh, wasn't played out the same way in the mainstream media there as it was uh, in the West, which was just insane amount i mean you can it's a fun thing to do to go to google and type in uh any number new cases so you can type in 572 new cases there will be a million links with that number it's just every they had like algos running every new number new report put on the website new update new number of cases and of course these cases were all sketchy as to what it was are they um uh, are they restricting movement in Nigeria and requiring vaccinated status? I, they were, but it's like everything in Nigeria, there's lack of enforcement. Like, we, we're, we're going to do this if you don't do this. And people are like, okay, we'll. And here's the thing, like, uh, Nigeria's corrupt. It's a bad thing, but in this case, you know, it actually turned out to be a good thing. So people can always, you know, find a way around, you know, whatever restrictions, you know, people come up with, the government come up with regarding, you know, enforcement of um, COVID-19, you know, vaccines. So the government are, is already aware of that, you know, this as a situation, the corruption situation. So they don't even bother trying to enforce. So everybody just were living their lives. You know, people like, for instance, when you go to church, they hand you a mask, but they don't actually expect you to wear it. It's like, we just follow in procedures, but you know, right. who cares, do what you want. And it's just the same kind of lackadaisical attitude that, you know, happens elsewhere nobody actually cares like people especially when you have you know very large you know, um uneducated uneducated you know population they don't get to hear you know all of this stuff you know happening in the west and tv seeing the riots everywhere here and there over vaccines mm-hmm. it's very alien to these people so like you said it's like the fear of fear at least from the way i see it. people are not falling you know dropping dead and people aren't right. sick right and they don't have any reason to fear so they haven't seen there are things they, they fear, you know, they fear Satan that they haven't seen much more that, you know, than the fear of vaccines or, you know, COVID, COVID itself. So it's like you said, it's the fear of fear and they don't have that fear. There's nothing to fear. They haven't seen anybody getting sick. So they're just going living their lives as usual. And some people might, some people do say that, you know, because, you know, they take anti-malaria drugs, but I don't Maybe. actually think it's the case. Because if you hear some people say things like, I lost, you know, this, um, sensation in my mouth, you know, it couldn't have, you know, this taste and um, sense, sense, uh, sense, uh, sense of taste yeah. and you know, headaches and stuff like that. You know, from, you know that it's probably COVID-19, you know, symptoms, but that's about it. About two or three days, you know, they're fine without having actually to take any medication whatsoever. So um, that's about it as, you know, regards to Nigeria. Yeah. Um, so just, just my own curiosity. I know that Bitcoin also had a little bit of adoption Oops. issues because, because um, you know, people consider right, so. it to be a scam. Is that, uh, did your power just go out? Yeah, it is um, the way of life. It's part of being a Nigerian, the epileptic, you know, Parker. <laughs> it happens. Well, you're still <laughs> on the air, brother. That's cool. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So go on, please. 
Well, no, I was just saying, is, has Bitcoin adoption moved forward? Are people a little less worried about it being scammy and now they're kind of more comfortable with it? No, 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 no. We, were, we are way past that right now. We are way, way, way past that. Good. Um, you, I think um, people might have felt that way. You know, I, most people's you know, uh, first experience with Bitcoin in Nigeria was through Ponzi schemes. You know, you know, Bitcoin being, you know, um, stun, um, anonymous by nature, um, it, prevent, it provided itself as an excellent you know, tool for, you know, scammers to actually, you know, obtain money from unsuspecting right. people. Yeah, so that was, you know, most people's first experience with Bitcoin. But as the, um, as the, um, as people, you know, people, once you have Bitcoin, you have to understand Bitcoin, you have to learn about Bitcoin. And as people got to, um, um, use Bitcoin, understand Bitcoin. The understanding of you know Bitcoin, you know now you know became uh, the experience, knowledge grew, and they started understanding Bitcoin for what it is, and started you know joining Twitter and other you know social media to learn more about you know Bitcoin. And right now, um, it's actually very huge. You know, government talks about bans and no bans, Good. but they can't stop it. We have a very very you know bubbling, um, we have a very bubbling P two P market and. Um, you know, things, P2P is like very huge in Nigeria because lots of people are into OTC, have OTC desk. And P2P is probably like, we have a WhatsApp group where we trade, you know, volumes of $100 million a month, you know, about 30 people. That, uh, we have, you know, lots of exchanges, lots of, you know, direct investment coming in from, um, you know, funds and you know, venture capitalists, you know, mm -hmm, in the West, mm -hmm. like um, Anderson Horowitz and um, the rest of them. So okay, very it's, good. It's too big. Yeah, it's too big to fail in Nigeria. Now, I think Excellent. the volumes or the adoption in Nigeria rivals. That is why you see lots of, you know, investments, crypto investments actually focus in Africa, and especially Nigeria, because we have sure. the population, we have the numbers, and we are actually doing, you know, quite well. We have, you know, yeah. adoption that rivals most countries in the West. And it can be, you know, for me personally, I think the reason is a lot of people trying to, you know, do well, you know, economically, you know, it, pres it presents an excellent opportunity for people to, you know, um, leave the trenches, you know. And um, yeah, so it's, it's huge and it can only get bigger from here. I love that, man. I and I really appreciate you taking the time to answer that. And I find it it's it, in one way it's really encouraging that you know 500 you know no one knows anyone who actually died it's crazy because i know five princesses from nigeria so it's it's just amazing <laughs> all right so i had to get that one in i had to do one fucking nigerian princess joke <laughs> good one <laughs> i appreciate it jerry that was very helpful thank you very much that's a that's a good takeaway for me Appreciate I it. Got, yeah. one, one thing we've got to do now is we've got to have to clip that bit where Jerry was talking in the dark. And you know those TV shows where they have the criminal like being interviewed? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And they have the walked voice? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, change the voice a little bit. It's like, <laughs> yeah. yes, well, you know, I'm here in Nigeria. Yeah, beautiful. That was beautiful. <laughs> and your Chanel t-shirt just lit up like crazy. Yeah. It was like beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, it was, it was almost scripted. And we could have it as like, you know, Adam Curry interviews, like, you know, uh, in Nigeria <laughs> secretly. Very, very secret Nigerian. <laughs> Nigeria needs to friends. stay anonymous. He's, he's breaking it open. It's not about <laughs> hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. It's, uh, yeah, we've got to do that. It's just too good not to. Um Man, I, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot. Yeah. I could, I think I could keep going for five hours with you, but, um, I'm wary we shouldn't do. Um, so yeah, I guess from my perspective, I just want to say, uh, thanks a hell of a lot for coming on Adam, man. It's been, uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, one of those life goals up there with, uh, I don't know, having a drink with Stone Cold Steve Austin, uh, it's, it's up oh, there. Oh, wow. Okay. Yourself, so, well, yeah. holy shit. Come to Texas, man. We'll, we'll do a drink Pre too. Oh, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. I, uh, hopefully I hope you come you. out there sometime um so yeah, we'll, as a, we'll always that's a know. huge no agenda fan this this was like having my own personal episode or something this was awesome oh man thank you wow. man thank you it's very kind of you I, I i i will report on this because what uh, jerry was telling me about uh, the fear is really is a that's a good good data point to have i'd like to pass that on to people that's awesome uh so yeah well i'm glad we gave you something to you know report on as well from the pod uh, so not only did we learn about yourself, but obviously you learn more about like uh, Nigeria and how uh, COVID and Bitcoin's doing over there, which is which is awesome. Uh, knowledge exchange, I guess you can put it. Of course, uh, true value for value. No, no worries there, mate. I'm good. I like it exactly. 
Well, okay. Well, let's say thanks. Thanks for coming on. It's been amazing. Thank you for everyone listening. It's been awesome to have you listening. Um, the summary of the entire podcast could essentially be uh, just buy Bitcoin and be happy. Um, so <laughs> it fixes everything. Yeah, it'll, just... it'll fix your erectile dysfunction. It's a perfect thing. It's a great remedy. Job done. Exactly. There's always there's always a way that it could. You know, removes the stress. The stress then removes the yeah, and then erectile dysfunction. I'm telling you, heals. I'm telling you it's Bam. a magic. It's a or the orange pill. Mm -hmm. Don't orange need a blue pill. one. Don't need a blue one. Yep. Job done. But yeah. So thanks. Thanks very much. And uh, everyone out there listening, have an amazing day, week, month, year, whenever you're listening, wherever you're listening. Uh, we love you lots and uh, take care. And thanks again, Adam. My pleasure. Thank you.